Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51 Percent, a show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, Twitter once again becoming a battleground in America as Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh faces allegations of sexual assault. Also, Sweden is the first country in the world to pursue a feminist foreign policy. We'll be asking its ambassador to France, Veronica van Danielsen, about the realities of implementing such an approach. And the World Surf League announces it's to introduce equal prize money for men and women, becoming the first US-based global sports league to do as such. But we begin in the States, which is facing a tidal wave of anger over allegations that Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh as a teenager assaulted Christine Blase Ford at a party in the 1980s, Kavanaugh having denied the allegations. But the controversy revealing yet again just how polarised America has become with US President Donald Trump criticising Ford for not reporting the alleged attack earlier. That itself leading to another Twitter campaign entitled Why I Didn't Report by Survivors of Sexual Assault. A nation riveted by the hearings on the Hill as Americans across the U.S. tuned in to watch Christine Blasey Ford deliver gut-wrenching testimony about her sexual assault. She's accused Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh of attacking her when they were teens. In his testimony, Kavanaugh angrily denied Ford's claims. As the Me Too and Time's Up movements continue to raise awareness of sexual abuse and misogynistic behavior, many are applauding what they say is Ford's courage in coming forward. And I think any time a woman comes out with this very uh, public in this very public way, a story of abuse or, or harassment, um, I think women throughout the entire country feel it, and I think that that creates this ripple effect throughout humanity, really, because women are the glue that pull things together. But Ford has also been harshly criticized for waiting so long to speak up. Even the U.S. president has attacked her. In response, thousands of people have taken to social media using the hashtag why I didn't report to show their support. I was sexually assaulted as a teen. Here's why I didn't report. It took me 30 years to tell anyone, and I'm far from alone. Padma Lakshmi, too, shared a powerful story of her assault in the New York Times, publicly acknowledging for the first time that she was raped when she was 16. To people saying, why didn't he or she report it? When something so evil happens to you, it takes a long time to process it. In our victim-blaming culture, it takes incredible courage to come forward. The victim is treated like the perpetrator. Sexual assault statistics are disheartening. According to the Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network, in the U.S., 7 out of 10 rapes and sexual assaults go unreported. Of those that are reported, less than 20 percent result in an arrest. Low conviction rates are one of the reasons victims don't come forward. Many say they're afraid they won't be believed and won't get justice. But with social media, the genie's out of the bottle as victims share their own personal stories. Here in France, a man has been fined 300 euros in jail for three months for slapping a woman on her buttocks. He also called her a whore and made lewd remarks aboard a bus. It's the first penalty levied under a new French law that aims to crack down on sexual harassment in public. The incident occurring last week in a Paris suburb when the 30-year-old man visibly drunk boarded a bus and began harassing a 21-year-old woman. The driver, as a result, locking the bus doors until the police arrived and arrested the offender. And staying in Europe and Sweden has become the first nation in the world to have a feminist foreign policy. In August this year, its government issuing a diplomatic handbook explaining what it takes to roll out such an approach. Veronica van Danusen is the Swedish ambassador to France and joins me in the studio. Thank you so much for your time, ambassador. The handbook, which you've got there, I believe runs to 111 pages. But in a nutshell, what exactly is a feminist foreign policy? It's based on the three so-called R's. R, the first R is the R for rights, supporting and promoting the rights. Human rights concern not only men, they concern women as well. So it looks at the legal and political basis. The second R is the R for representation. 
we have noted, everybody noticed that in many areas of decision taking, women are not sitting at the table. This, that right implies that every, in every situation where decisions are taken that would concern and should concern women, women have to sit at the table. So the R for representation is key. And the third right is the R, the, the, the third R is the R for resources. We have to see that we develop resources, that we have sufficient resources to meet the needs of women and men equally in our development cooperation, but even going far beyond development cooperation. But it's not an easy path to tread, is it? I mean, cast your mind back to three years ago in 2015 when there was a diplomatic stoush between Saudi Arabia and Sweden after your foreign minister criticised Riyadh over its record on women's rights. Absolutely. Um, since then, we have moved, we have continued cooperating with Saudi Arabia. We stand up for this, our views. We look at the developments uh, in our own country where women, women's participation in politics, women's participation in the economy is actually smart economics as well. And if we look at the country you now mentioned, we work with many countries in the world, including with Saudi Arabia, we are starting to see openings even in Saudi Arabia, not wanting to make a direct link between the views we are and the rights we are defending. But I think it will be different from one country, from one region, from one culture to another. But the important is to be able to prove that it is beneficial for the countries concerned to include women at every level of society. And it's, as I was saying earlier, it's also smart economics. Now, coming back to Sweden itself, the far right has become the third major political force in the country, thanks to immigration becoming a hot potato issue. Of course, Sweden taking in more refugees than any other European country per capita. So how is this impacting women's rights in your nation? I don't see the issue of having a generous, um, a generous uh, policy for migration, which Sweden has, has always had. In 2015, Sweden was the country in the EU that took most of the refugees coming from both Syria and Afghanistan uh, to Sweden per capita, even more than Germany. But once they come to Sweden, they have to accept that we stand up for equal opportunities for men and women. Uh, they have to adapt to Swedish laws, they have to adapt to the Swedish society, they have to be able to integrate. And there are, of course, various programs and projects working to help them understand after a period of sort of uh, adapting themselves. Can you tell me Swedish... just a, a little bit about the sort of steps that are taken to integrate those new arrivals? It's a work that, continu that is continuing. Uh, you're looking about the re re women's refugees coming in. Uh, that was also one of the difficulties when we had such a massive influx of refugees coming at the same time, that we want to be able to have sound integration policies where women and men have different needs. And because we you know, look at them differently, we try to meet these different needs. It is quite a costly uh, integration program to allow also young women coming in, young girls coming in. Mainly in Sweden, the refugees have been male coming in. And we have seen basically 30% of the unaccompanied Unaccompanied, unaccompanied minors come to Sweden because they know that we have a quite generous policy and that we try to meet the needs of both boys and girls, men and women, differently according to the specific needs of the groups. And there is a specific need in regards to the male refugees, particularly if they come from a traditional uh, Muslim society, in terms of un making them understand the need for equality. Absolutely. It takes time. I don't. I would not. I would not pretend that we have found the perfect solution. Uh, international meetings uh, at every level, where we compare notes, where we look at every society will have different integration policies. We share experiences. We try to learn from others. It is an issue that takes time. So of course there have been problems. There have been mistakes. And uh, I think it was more. It wasn't the issue of women, men, or women's right uh, aspects that led to the the um, extreme right uh, increase in Sweden at the during the last elections i think it was more the number that came very suddenly and the lack of solidarity which we felt uh, in in the eu that not all the countries could share our approach and our view and that if we still today don't have an adequate adequate um, system of solidarity uh, among the 28 eu member states finally we always see Sweden as being at the vanguard of women's rights, but uh, again, you only have to look back at the recent controversy involving the Nobel uh, Prize for Literature, which was cancelled as a result of a sexual harassment scandal, which just goes to show that even in your country, 
you're not immune to such things. Yes, we have problems. I mean, even in the Me Too campaign, uh, I think the Swedes and Swedish women and Swedish women's organizations reacted very vividly, very actively. I think the work has to continue, and particularly in my own country as well. So I will not want to sit and say, we have found all the issues. Look at Sweden. Sweden is still working on this, and we have to work on it, both in our own country, in Europe, and also at global level. Ambassador, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for inviting me. And finally, here's a bit of good news. The World Surf League has announced it will offer equal prize money to both men and women from 2019, making it the first US-based global sports league to apply equal pay. Making waves towards gender equality. It's taken them more than 40 years, but the World Surf League has announced they're closing the gender pay gap. For these women surfers, it's a landmark moment. Pretty much cried. I had like goosebumps and I was like, oh my gosh, I couldn't believe it. It was a dream. It's just such a huge statement for the WSL to be making. Um, you know, they're actually putting words into action and I think the rest of the world is just going to receive it um, as an incredible progressive step forward. The World Surf League operates more than 180 events worldwide. All of these competitions will now offer equal prize money for men and women. CEO Sophie Goldschmidt says a move is part of a wider plan to promote women's surfing. We've added women's events, we've um, increased um, the number of women surfing, we've increased prize money, um, we've invested in marketing um, and promotion. So there's really been a journey um, that we've been on over the last few years. So this is just a next natural step. The sport has drawn criticism for sexism in the past, with female athletes stereotyped as bikini babes in marketing campaigns. But now it's paving the way for pay parity, with a move that's likely to put pressure on other big sports organisations that continue to pay men and women at different rates. And that's it for now. You can also connect with us via our Facebook page, that of course being France24.51%, or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. So until our next show, bye for now.